Hello and welcome wonderful people, I am the Loose Critic, and today I'll be giving you my loose impressions of Songs of Conquest, a game created by Lava Potion. This is Lava Potion's first release, though they are published by Coffee Stain, who also published the Sanctum series, Valheim, and Deep Rock Galactic. They also notably are both the publisher and developer behind Satisfactory, which I have plenty of hours in at this point. It is an early access title set in a fantasy world which is very reminiscent of Heroes of Might and Magic, specifically 3. So if you have played that in the past or you grew up playing that series, this is going to likely be a game you'll want to pick up. It is a turn-based tactics game with a grid-based system for combat, which we'll see when we get into there. I have roughly 4 hours played at this point. Um, but let's get into the options menu. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you is that not under the gameplay or video, but actually the sound, you'll see I have the master volume set to 10% right now. I'm going to show you what this was like when I first started up the game. Please, um, if you are headphone wearers, brace yourselves. I cannot hear myself speak. I do not understand why the music volume starts out quite this loud. It is ridiculous. Uh, I have been playing with this at 50%, but for the sake of this, I'll also turn the volume down 50%, so that'll put the volume, the music volume around 25%. But yeah, the, the music, while beautiful in this game, is extremely loud and very in-your-face. All right, well, getting back into the settings, let's start with gameplay, uh, the first tab here. Uh, language supports a variety of languages already, which is always awesome to see. There is a battle log, which I have set to auto hide, which is the default. All of my settings are currently at their defaults. I have not touched with uh, any of this. And the always hide, always show. Honestly, I haven't even noticed the battle log with always uh, auto hide on. The damage vignette, I'm assuming that this is the flashing red that you usually see in other games. Uh, we can poke with that when we get into game. Show blood in battle that, I'm going to be honest, there's not a lot of blood. Has subtitles. Uh, show wielder movement range. This is something I'll demonstrate when we get into game. Uh, something I think is useful to turn on. A couple of other miscellaneous settings that uh, I'll get into once we get into game and show off what they do. And then coming down here, we have end turn behavior. There are two options here, simple and advanced. I have no idea what either of these do. Uh, when I tested it in game, it didn't seem to change anything at a glance. Uh, I wish there was some tooltips here that would explain what these settings do a bit more. Some of them, like screen shake, that's pretty obvious what that's going to do. It's going to stop the screen from shaking or make a shake, isn't it? But other ones here, just they need some more descriptions. Uh, it's an early access game though, so that's not too surprising. Uh, supports quick auto saves, quick saves, always good to see. And there's a big button down here to reset your campaign progress. Uh, I haven't pressed this at all, and I'm not going to. And video, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You have your resolution, full screen or not. V-Sync, I have it disabled. My monitor uses G-Sync. Uh, when those two things combine, it's just not very pretty. Uh, graphics quality defaulted to high for me. I haven't tested very high or the lowest yet. I'm going to do that in this video. And then it has Bloom, Depths of Field, and AI Frame Rate Budget. Defaults at 30. Sound, as we went over, the music is absurdly loud. And the sound effects volumes, that's totally fine. There are chat sound effects because this game does support multiplayer. I have not touched that at all. Controls, sensitivity, this has all seemed totally fine for me. I haven't had any issues with the sensitivity there. I have edge panning disabled. It was disabled by default. Uh, but I imagine... If you like to use your cursor to scroll rather than click and drag or WASD, that is a good setting to turn on. Going down into key bindings, this, this is something that I encountered a couple of issues with. So the first being that if you come down to something that is used in other menus, such as the build menu, uh, and we go down to, so you see here battle, like we have use troop ability, Q, or we have move to destination, Q. Or we have build menu, select small category, Q. We come down here to move destination and we remove that binding. And then we try to rebind that by pressing Q. You can't. 
it gives you an error saying that this button's already bound, even though it was bound here just a second ago by default. And the only way to get it back if you want to return that to defaults is to reset all of your key bindings to default. I haven't found a way around that yet. I don't think there is one at this point. You also can't bind Alt, Control, or Shift on their own, even though down here in Toggle Info Mode, uh, which is something I use a lot in this game, and it is also not a toggle from what I have experienced, uh, if you remove that and you go to rebind it, pressing Alt, I'm mashing it right now, does not do anything. You cannot rebind it. Same with Control and Shift. So, oh, accidentally hit Enter there. Uh, just like the other issue, the only way to bring that back is to click Return to Default and it will come back. Uh, map editor, I have not poked this yet. Uh, yeah. So for now, uh, let's check out the multiplayer. I'm not going to actually hop into anything right now. There are a couple of different regions. Oh, there's a lot of different regions, actually. Uh, for some reason, I am defaulted to Europe. I don't know if that's just a title default. If we go to USA West. There is not currently a lot. It is a little late in the day, but I would expect to be, see more than a couple of games. But so don't expect a large community just by default that is open has open games. This is kind of similar to Civilization series though, where most of the time you're gonna to want to be playing with friends. Going into the single player, there are skirmishes and there are campaigns. At campaigns right now there are currently only two i imagine that upon release there will be a full section for each of the different factions there are four currently we'll get into those when we look at the skirmishes and then there are also custom campaigns created by the community i haven't looked at this too much but there are quite a lot of different things to poke here I imagine that that's going to add quite a bit of replay value and longevity to the game. Going back into the single player menu and the campaign, I have only played through the first three quarters of the song of the Stout Heart. I haven't touched from the ashes yet, but as you can see here, one, two, three, four. Right now there are four missions here, and in ashes there are similarly four. There are only two difficulties, normal and hard. It does not explain what the difference between those are. I imagine a lot of it is enemy numbers, potentially AI behavior, but again, not explained. No clue what the difference is at a glance. Looking at skirmishes, in here there are a bunch of different maps. One of them, which is PvP battle only, does not work with AI. But otherwise, there are quite a few maps, up to a maximum of six players on the biggest map. And there appear to be a couple of different objectives to win. This one example is claim all of the beacons. And then there are a lot to the first to the center gets the goodies, which I imagine is just there's a bunch of resources in the middle. I don't think that's a win condition. A little inconsistent there. But otherwise, it looks like a lot of these are typically just kill the other person before they kill you. Something I did notice here that I want to highlight. So if you come up here to defeat thy neighbor, you can see that all four of the available classes are here and you can choose from any one of them to hop into gameplay with. Now, some of these maps, such as Ruckus, you are locked to a specific faction. And if you add AI, Similarly, they are all locked. I'm imagining this has to do with map spawns and available resources to you and what is important to each faction. Uh, it's something that I think is interesting. I'm not quite sure how I feel about it, honestly. It's a strange to feel like the map is balanced to a specific faction in each area. Although, things like this, where it is a map that has both players locked to a single faction, but why? <laughs> I would imagine that if you needed to lock the factions, it would be do each one would be different, you know? Otherwise, why not let somebody put themselves at a disadvantage on the map to try a different class on the map? Just seems like an odd design choice to me. In the map settings, you have a few different options you can tweak. 
You can adjust the resources to be higher or greater. Same with the rest of these, which are the neutral dwelling troop production, wielder caps. Wielders are the heroes of this game. The characters that can cast spells, the characters leading your army. And we'll look at that once we get into gameplay. Hostile growth rate. This is how quickly all of the AI mobs on the map would be increasing in strength as the game goes on. And then force quick battle, which is just a good option to have for the multiplayer aspect of this game, so you don't have to waste time watching all of your characters slowly walk towards each other and play all of their animations. And then there's also disabling random events for people who don't like that little extra RNG in their gameplay. I'm also realizing I, oh, okay, no, 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 escape. I was mashing escape to try to go back into a menu. It doesn't work. You have to click leave, I'm assuming. No, <laughs> that just puts you in the lobby. All right, I can't actually, I, I'm not sure how I got out of that menu. Hold on, single player skirmish. Oh, leave lobby button. I'm just blind, ignore me. Uh, it is a little weird, escape doesn't take you out, but I am glad I accidentally clicked on the button that does take you out. It is just tucked away in the top left corner. All right. Well, with that said, let's hop into game, shall we? Let's start with the campaign. This will allow me to show you what I have experienced so far and some of the highlights of the gameplay. So this is pretty late into the second chapter of the game. This is actually towards the end of it. As you can see, the map is pretty dang huge. Um, on this campaign, though, you don't actually get to explore a lot of this darkened area. In fact, it cuts off once you get to about right here, and it starts into the next mission. Something I really like about the graphics here is that the trees are... Well, I think it's parallaxation. That's what that is called. But you zoom in, and you see how they tilt towards you a little bit. A lot of the buildings do that. It just gives you a nice little feeling of perspective as you, you zoom in closer. and makes them pop out at you like a pop-up storybook, and they feel a little bit more alive. With that said, let's take a look at the graphic options here. Let's turn these down to their lowest and take a look at that. That is quite the difference. This is actually extremely reminiscent of the original graphics of Heroes and Might and Magic. Wow. Still do the neat parallaxing, but that is quite the difference. I'm curious about how this actually looks in combat. Putting that back up. Let's see. Very high. Not too much of a difference that I can see between very high and just high. There's some shadow differences in the terrain quality when you turn it on very high. You can see, uh, like down here in the grass, high versus very high, or like some of these rocks pop in and out. So there's a, a bit of a texturing difference on the map itself. So, these are your wielders. Right now, you have two of them in this campaign. You have Vilja, not even gonna try to pronounce that correctly. And you have Cecilia. Cecilia is the main character for this campaign. Over here, you can see that uh, she must not die. That is one of your objectives. If your other wielder dies, uh, it's not too big of a deal. They will be able to be bought back in a town, if you have a town. In the wielders section here, you can see that right now you are capped at two. This value appears to change depending on how big your towns are. And once your towns reach a certain point, it opens you up to purchasing another wielder. In the campaign, very similar to the heroes campaigns back in the day, your Wielders are capped at a certain level. In this case, it is eight. But like I was saying, went on a tangent there. When your wielder dies, if it is not your main hero, you can purchase them back over the course of five turns. It costs five of most of your resources and some money. And when five turns pass, it is free to recruit them back. So essentially you have five turns you have to wait if they die, and then you can bring them back at no cost to you, and if you want them sooner, you gotta pay. Let's take a look at the characters themselves. So each character has their own stats, which are imparted upon their army. 
you have offense and defense and down here you can see troop modifiers that that changes your melee offense and your ranged offense as well as your defense and your spell damage resistance and then movement only affects your hero on this overworld map i keep i'm gonna keep calling them heroes they're wielders <laughs> it's gonna be hard a hard adjustment to make uh, but, and their view radius, which shows how much on the overworld they actually see when they move. Uh, in the uh, each hero has a specialization. I don't believe that this is true for all heroes. Oh, it probably is actually. I lied. It would make sense that they're it is unique for all heroes. For some reason, I was thinking Cecilia didn't have one, but she does. She gets one order essence, which we'll get into when we get into combat. We'll talk about essences. But yeah, then you have three tabs down here that show your troop modifiers, which is going to be things that affect your troops in combat. And then you have temporary modifiers from interacting with overworld objects. And then you have your equipment modifiers, which is all of the bonuses that you are getting from your equipment, which is over here. Which, again, very reminiscent of the Heroes games. You have your helmets, chests, your left and right hand, gloves, boots, and accessory slots. And so far, these have all done pretty straightforward things. They've increased the essence that you get, your movement speed, your defense, your damage output. Nothing too unique. Some movement and view radius increases. And if you want to trade between your heroes, you have to have them interact like this. And then you can change both equipment and your armies. Each hero, as they level up, gets an option to choose between a skill. Command is one of those skills. When you level up, if you do not take command, you are stuck with a smaller army. Which, depending on your playstyle, is a good thing or a bad thing. Because if you don't take command, you get to choose essentially between two other seemingly at random choices that impact how your army will behave so for instance Vilja here has melee plus 10 melee offense uh, I went down the route that increased her experience gain which in retrospect if I had realized that the levels were going to be capped I probably wouldn't have bothered uh, and paired which gives your troops initiative when we do the skirmishes I'll probably demonstrate that leveling up screen but then down here Every 8 levels, so 8, 16, and 24, you get to choose a power. And down here, you can see that she has attuned. At the start of each combat, she's going to get one of each of these essences, which are these little things up here. So you have Arcana, Creation, Destruction, Chaos, and Order. And that lets you cast spells once you get into combat. If you look at Cecilia down here, you'll see she has Farsight. Her ranged troops have an additional increased one range, which works out very well, considering one of the skills that I focused on for her was archery. So there's some synergy there. Speaking of combat, I think that we... Well, let's look at the overworld briefly. Let's look at the towns. We'll do, we'll do combat a little later. So over here, you can see we have things like gold mines, water mills. These give different resources. Water mill gives gold. Gold mine gives gold. Up here in the top right, we have a Celestial Ore Mine, which gives you one of those per round. We have Ancient Amber Excavation, which gives you one of those per round. And all of that is tracked up here in the top right with the little green icons showing you how much you are gaining. And I would assume if you were losing, those would be red with a minus symbol instead of a plus symbol. Over here, these are what the towns look like. No longer must you go into a, an entirely different menu like you did in Might and Magic. Heroes of Might and Magic. Might and Magic is very different. But over here, you can see the towns have tiers, and you upgrade these, and that impacts how many of these buildings that you have that you can use. At level 1, this town only had these two small slots. At level 2, it gained, I believe, a medium slot and a large slot. Might have been a large and a medium and a small. And then at tier 3, I got this last large slot. Now, I'm saying different sizes of slots. What does that mean? Well, if we do a quick save here, and I destroy one of these over here, you'll see you can build. A, there are small buildings, there are medium buildings, and there are large buildings. And you need that size of slot to build that type of building. 
You cannot build large slots in medium or large slots. It must be in a small slot, vice versa for medium and large. Now, some of these buildings have prerequisites. For example, the castle, you must have a peasant hut currently built. And once you do that, if you want to upgrade that into its tier 2, you must also have a... Oop, nope, that was the barracks. <laughs> you must also have a quarry created. Now, something that I learned was that you don't need to keep those buildings around once you've built it. So, you have built the peasant hunt, you've built a quarry, you can sell those, and then you keep the castle. And that is going to be, I imagine, a very important strategy when it comes to diversifying what units you're able to build. Now, buildings like the castle... They create units per turn that you can buy when you bring your wielders back to town. In this case, the castle builds a knight, or if it's a tier 2, a knight of Fist of Order. And these will populate at 1 per round, as you can denote it by this plus 1. Over in these small buildings, peasant huts, they build plus three militia, and if you upgrade them, plus three sappers. And you can see that for the minstrels, or the troubadours, and each one of these buildings that you have, you get that amount per building. So I had two of these upgraded castles, I was getting two of the Fist of Orders per turn that I could purchase. Let's reload real quick, shall we? Alright. Now, I think I'll demonstrate real quickly what actually the buying menu looks like. That'll take three turns. This is actually a good opportunity for some complaints I have right now. So, up here in the top right, there is a movement button. If you press this button, or if you plan a move with another character, uh, you'll see it appears here on their small profile picture, and you can click that to automatically move them to wherever you had previously planned. Something I don't like is that you can totally just hit end turn here, and even though you have a planned movement here, it will not go through. You hit it, it just goes back to the next turn. I really wish there would be an option to have a notification warning you that you have not used all of your movement points and confirming that you want to end your turn there. Just a small quality of life thing that would be appreciated. But going into the town, this is the buying menu. So when you buy a unit, you can de designate with a slider how many you want to buy. And then they get placed up here. If you do not have room to buy anybody, then it will not let you. Actually, that is not the right way to do this. Hmm. I don't know if I'll be able to demonstrate it, but it doesn't let you purchase it. Uh, down here, you can see that I have 25 of these castle guys, and they are expensive. They are a thousand gold apiece and one of these purple rocks. Now... I'm only getting one of those purple rocks a turn, and you can build a marketplace where you can buy more, and you can sell your excess logs and stone and other materials. Uh, I don't have one of those at the moment. So right now, I'm buying one of these a turn, essentially. <laughs> and then, up here, what I did earlier, you probably saw, was split my army. And you can do this manually, you can press a button to easily split it so that each Pile is equal, or you can move as many as possible to maximize a stack. With that, I think that we should get into some combat, shall we? Now, the story mode, there's typically a dialogue when one wielder is going to be fighting another one. In this case, we are fighting Silk Spool. Which, to avoid spoilers, I'll probably just skip through this. Not that there's too significant of spoilers for this story. It's a very typical intrigue story so far. 
going into the combat, this is the first screen that you'll see when you go to engage a combat or you are engaged with a combat. You have the withdraw button, which lets you run away. And if you choose to run away, then you cannot run away if the enemy chooses to attack you in the next turn. You can move all of your units into your blue tiles here and organize them however you want. There are different elevations, which unfortunately on this map I won't get to demonstrate, but higher elevation equal good, lower elevation equal bad. There is a quick battle option if you don't want to manually handle the battle yourself, but where is the fun in that? Let's see. I think that's good. Let's hop into it. Welcome to the battle screen. First things first, let's talk about these guys, the essence. So, unlike Heroes of Might and Magic, you cannot cast spells in the overworld. All spells are going to be happening in the battle screen. There is a spell book here, and these are the spells that you can cast. I haven't actually checked if these are different across different factions or if they are the same. We can actually check that later when I go in to show you the skirmishes. So over here you have Order, Chaos, Destruction, Creation, and Arcana. Each faction specializes in generating different amounts of these better than other factions. In this case, uh, the faction I currently am generates a lot of Order. How do you generate Essence? Each character you have in your army, when it is their turn, generates essence orbs. In this case, the Fists of Order generate order and chaos, the Sappers generate order, and the Troubadours generate two creation and one chaos orb. Similarly, because I'm fighting another uh, hero, <laughs> the word escapes my mind every time, another wielder they also get essence for their characters. In this case, he's going to get two orders when his musketeer goes, two when his pikeneers go, and two... <laughs> he's just going to be getting a lot of order. <laughs> but you can cast spells with this, which I'll demonstrate as combat goes on. Some of your units will have special abilities that you can use. In this case, the Fist of Orders gives strengthen to adjacent enemies, or er, allies, adjacent allies. It would be a terrible thing if they gave your enemies a buff. So I'm going to move this guy to hit these three, and then use strengthen. If I click on them, you can see strengthened, plus 20 melee offense, plus 20 ranged offense, and plus one damage. And then down here is the initiative order. Each unit is going to have its own initiative. You can see here highlighting over my sappers, I have an initiative of 18. Meanwhile, his pipers have an initiative of 24. And below him, he is tied with their veteran pioneers. I'm not sure actually what wins ties in this case. I'm sure there's some hidden mechanic to it. But then the veteran musketeers have an initiative of 15, and they're going last. And then this middle icon indicates the round. So this start of round two and that's when all of this happens so you can highlight over enemies to see their movement range which is indicated by the light red line you can see their melee attack which is the rippling red area and then for ranged units there are two orange outlines you can see there you can see one on the far left edge of the screen the thin orange line and that is going to be their farthest attack range they can shoot anything within that area but then you're going to see a thicker orange line about halfway back towards the character what is that that is called the one moment let me uh, make sure i'm saying this right by just skipping down to my rangers and making sure i believe that that is the lethal damage range Let's see here. Deadly range. That's what it's called. The deadly range. And that essentially means ranged units, when they're attacking something within that heavy orange line, they do double damage. Plus 100% damage. And something else you'll see here, though, is that my ranged character moved and has a minus 50% damage. Yes, when ranged characters move, they deal half damage for that turn. So there's a bit of a balancing act between strategically pre-placing your ranged units when you 
are in between attacks. What do I mean by in between attacks? Some ranged units, not all, have to reload after they fire. So if I have him fire, you see he is now in a reload animation. Next turn, he's not going to be able to attack, and that is the perfect time to move him around somewhere else. These guys also have abilities that they can use. In this case, he can place a stake in front of him, which is a essentially a rock with HP that the enemies can attack, but they cannot move through until it is destroyed. Let's get the enemy card over here. You'll see now I have access to a lot more spells now that I have gathered a lot more essence. And here you can click on this and it will be a real easy list to look through what you can do. I'm going to use Rally. Let's do that. And that buffs all of my units for a turn. And something about the Fists of Order units is they are affected by uh, moving. When they move, you see they have the Charger effect. They receive plus 10 melee offense for each tile that they have moved. So if I move over here, you're going to see now, if I look at his buffs, he has plus 50 melee offense. If I move one more, he has plus 60. So they deal a lot of damage as long as they're able to get a big wind up. We can come down here and do the same thing here. And Bard's special ability, oh, I say Bard, Troubadours, uh, they increase the defense and of their allies. And this is all allies, it doesn't matter if they're adjacent like the Fists bonus does. So you see I cannot attack when reloading, so I can just reposition him and end his turn. And what you just saw was a retaliatory attack. Each unit by default gets one retaliatory attack. When I was messing with skirmishes, it looked like there was potential for characters that could do that more than once, or there were spells that let you do that more than once. And there are also spells that allow you to attack twice. So if I, which one of you go first? I'm probably not going to get the chance, but I've cast that spell on him. So now when it is his turn, he will get to attack twice, but he will probably just one shot this poor fool. And he did. And this is the end of match slow-mo that was in the settings that we saw earlier. And that is combat. And there's a nice little post-combat screen. It tells you how many units you lost, how many units your opponent lost, any rewards that you got. And as we move into here, there's going to be a small cutscene. Not really a cutscene, more just some extra dialogue. Something I don't like about this, though, is not that it matters because this is the end of the campaign, but Vilja was higher north before we came down here, and now she is down here. So if I had been trying to move her up here at all, I would have to start that all over again. That's uh, an interesting mechanic, but again, this is the end of the campaign, so it doesn't make too big of a difference. It is a little silly, though, that it is the end of the campaign, and there's... There's, there's some nice details here. There's some stuff you can come down and collect. There, there's essentially one more fight that happens over here, though, and then you're done. Which I will probably go and do really quick just to demonstrate uh, something I really like about this game. I'll keep it a secret for now. And so over here, this is an example of the taking over a fortress. Come up to it. Normally there would be a fight. You would go into a combat against their defenses. This place doesn't have any. It's a campaign place. But you can see there's empty slots here, there's an empty slot here, and when we go and we upgrade this, two more slots appear, woo! And this is the market. Now that we have that, I can show that to you. So over here, you can see that uh, you can buy and purchase each resource. So if you wanted to sell, say, I have a bunch of wood, I don't need all that wood, but I want to buy some celestial ores so that I can buy a lot more of my Fists of Order, I can do that. And something else here is that typically you can only buy the troops that are being made in that town. So right now, all of these horsemen that are being made up here, I cannot purchase down here. If I try, if I click on this and I go in here, I can only buy some minstrels and some footmen. If I build a rally point and I wait for that to be built. Boom, it is built. I can now... Wait. Purchase troops. Oh, hey. 
I'm assuming I might have to actually go interact with that. I actually haven't used this yet. Yes, you have to interact with the rally point. All right, I learned something. But you can purchase all of the units from other places. So I could purchase the seven horsemen that I can afford here. I can come over here. And I can pass them off and restock her. In fact, let's just do that real quick. Make this next fight easy. And so coming over here. And so this is us being attacked. And so in this case, we're on the right side of the screen. And over here, you see there is some elevation, so we can mess with that. I'm actually going to probably split my units up a bit for that. Let's go into it. So, options, gameplay. Let's turn on the damage vignette. Let's see. I'll show Wielder Mage. I'll show that after this. Oh, one quality of life option that I haven't turned on yet because I wanted to play with the default settings, but I think I'll really like is the auto equip stronger artifacts. This is all the equipment that you could equip uh, on your character screen and it just saves some time. It's a nice quality of life feature I think I'd appreciate unless I had a specific piece of unique equipment that might have been giving me a bonus, but so far... All of the upgrades have seemed pretty linear in what they do with some mix and mash between offhand weapons versus shields. And I think that's really about it <laughs> that needs adjusted in here. Yeah, all right. Well, let's go ahead and just buff our range units. And then all of his frog boys get to go. And all of these, all of your opponent's units, once you're in combat, you are totally free to click on them and investigate them and see what stats or debuffs they have, what any unique things they might have. But in this case, all we know is that they create uh, creation essence and destruction essence, and they are the Rana faction. So these are those frog-like people I was talking about before. Let's back up. You can see we've already got a bunch of spells that we can cast. Not too many, I think we need to. Um, and normally I would take him into the high ground, but he can already one-shot most of these frogs, so I think we'll just leave him up there. Oof. Ranged is pretty strong. Um, let's go ahead and try... Swap. Swap is the spell that lets you just switch places with an ally. So because the horse guy can run farther than our bard, let's swap them so the bard can make it up to this guy in his next turn. And we'll have our Fist of Order come down here and kill this boy. And because we're going to be using the bard to attack, we can go ahead and give him a buff. Um, no, we can't. I forgot we need a movement point in order to be able to do that. But... Um, what can we do here? We can go ahead and just in case he ever, you know, in case we don't one shot him because no, we won't one shot him actually. Uh, we did just lower his damage with one of our spells so that our troubadours take a little bit less damage. And our rangers are reloading so they can't do anything. So I'll leave this to our mounted unit. And I am very over prepared for this fight. I wanted to get uh, ready so that it wouldn't be too much of a struggle to demonstrate it. All right. And now for the thing I was saying that I really like about this game. I mentioned that the music was extremely loud on the front end menu and it was very loud here too, but I wasn't nearly as mad <laughs> because, and you'll see why. Feared him and all the bandits that 
die Heide. But walking dead and pain had now appeared. No time for cheers, just swords and spears. So every campaign mission, it seems, at least from one to two and two to three, has a nice little instrumental i'm not sure if that is true for from three to four or if it's true for the other campaign but it's beautiful and i love it all right well with that said let's go into the skirmish that i have going on this is six turns in i think very fresh so we'll just play through it a bit i am the undead faction my wielder is corral lightbringer so far I have a shield, but I do not have it equipped because it has uh, minus one movement. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any real workaround for this uh, other than just you don't use it until you're about to go into combat and then you equip it. Uh, and you can see I've leveled him up a couple times. I've got his command up to four and his guard up to two. I'm going to probably kind of make his army pretty tanky. You will see here that in my movement, my available movement, is highlighted in green. That is the setting I was talking about here, the show wielder movement range. If you turn this off, that is not there. Even when you press right click, it doesn't show up. Now, if you hold alt, this is extremely useful. It highlights every interactable that you can see and also displays that movement range. I'm going to turn that back on. Uh, in the settings menu, it says that this is the toggle. To me, toggle means when you press the button, it turns on. And when you press it again, it turns off. So if I just press it, nothing. You have to hold it. It is not a toggle, it is a hold. Just some terminology there that uh, is a little annoying because this means that I'm playing most of the game holding this down because I hate potentially missing out on anything and it also just makes it a lot clearer to explain what you're looking at so over here let's use the last of my movement let's see this spire is guarded there's a band of troops here between the 25 and 100 in number i only have 27 units and i don't want to engage in that quite yet let's see down here similar kind of want to build up some more troops uh, in my small little town here to upgrade I need to get five stones so I think that I'll probably make my way down here to this uh, set of stone down here so let's let's work towards that and when you are not in combat turns can go pretty fast and so what I'm doing now is I'm interacting with a bunch of these overworld objects um, some of these can give bonuses, such as this milestone. When you visited it, it gave me two movement for that turn. And then this gave me 500 XP the first time I visited it. And these can be revisited by different wielders or after a few turns have passed, depending on some of the circumstances for your wielder. There are some of these that give bonuses for entering com or for like one combat. When that combat's done, after a few more turns, you can go back and you can revisit that to get the bonus again. Uh, the only problem there is the time that it takes you to go and do that. Let's see, cultists. I actually haven't done a combat with this class yet. This is all new to me. Let's just go into it, shall we? This will also let us look at the spells. The spells are the same. Good to know. And so, glories of gone plus five melee and range offense to allies. So this is essentially the bard, but it does damage instead of tankiness. All right, let's see. Let's move you forward. And you are going to be able to attack. So I think I'm going to leave you up here so that you take a little bit less damage for being on higher ground. And something that you're not seeing a lot of is the in-game tutorial it is extremely thorough. There is a 
pop up for almost everything that you need to learn. There is very detailed descriptions, almost a little too detailed in some regards. Sometimes it's like three or four paragraphs telling you how to do each thing. There is an option to disable it every time it pops up if you're done with the tutorial and you're sick and tired of it. But that is something I really appreciate. Uh, a good first time user experience is always appreciated. I can cast some spells. What do we have here? Uh, target friendly gets double essence for two rounds. All right. That's neat. Destroy essence. Target enemy loses all essence production. That, I imagine, is very strong uh, when fighting another wielder. Absolutely useless. As you can see, when there's no wielder and you're just fighting uh, neutral AI, they cannot use spells. And then I can make a uh, tanky. Let's go ahead and do that. And what is your range? And I'm not going to attack him because I don't want him to retaliate, retaliate and get that extra damage on me. But because I have busted his defense and he is in melee range, so if he leaves, he provokes an attack of opportunity for me. And he will likely just melee. And that was still enough to kill me, so it didn't really matter in the end. <laughs> I guess that is a stack of 16. Uh, let's see, what can we do here? Plus 10 damage. Kill one unit. That seems pretty strong if you're fighting a bunch of very big units. Not so useful against a big group of smaller units. Target friendly troop gets range resistance. That won't matter here soon. Yeah, I think we just uh, buff his damage. And we'll come down here and hit you soon. And that slow-mo, you can disable it. I think it's a nice touch. And a bonus of this faction, apparently, is that the undead can come back after a combat. You can get some Risen, which generate Arcana Essence. Neat. All right, well, that is very good to know. Uh, so the reason we came down here was to get some stone. So let's grab these. And these are tools of the Master Mason, which are a trinket that gives you plus two stone while it's equipped. All right, that is perfect. And so now I should be able to upgrade the excavation. That has given me a medium slot and two more small slots. And so over here, I want, let's see, I'm trading post. That is essentially the market of the humans. I want to build the, hmm, I think the mausoleum, which requires five amber and five wood. So that should be my next goal, I think. Uh, let's finish grabbing these. And see, this is something that if I hadn't pressed all here, I, I was in between the shiny moment here, well, the sparkles, I might have completely missed this was an interactable object, which I can't interact with this turn because I'm out of movement, but. That's why I would really like for this to be a, a, a true toggle rather than a, a hold. Some of the overworld objects you interact with are a once-off. They give you a choice between two things. In this case, some glimmer weave or some gold. I'll take the glimmer weave. Thank you very much. Got a bubbling bog, which gave me some wood and some amber. All right. So I'm pretty close to being able to build a mausoleum. I just need three more amber. Hmm. I'm not seeing any amber on the map off the top of my eyes. Let's see. So there are old camps as well. These are important in the early game. When you go to camps like these, you get a choice between gold or some units. They are a good way to build up your army in the early game. Let's go ahead and take out this guy. I'm going to be honest, I clicked way too fast. I'm not sure what happened there. It definitely was not an auto battle. I think maybe I might have overpowered them enough that they died. I'm not sure. That was very fast. That I, I don't like that I, I was able to accidentally click oh, past that so fast. All right, let's go ahead and let's touch this crumbling tower. That was a very inefficient use of my movements. And this is the level up screen. So here... Uh, you can see that he gained plus one defense and offense in his skills. 
And then you get to choose between three skills. Command, which increases the number of slots you can have in your army. Learning, which is the increased experience gain, which I personally have always been a fan of in every game that I play. I just like that slight speed advantage of leveling up quicker than other people. Or the third level of guard, which makes my guys tankier, which I did say I was going to make this guy be very tanky. So I'm going to, against my, my judgment, I'd rather get the XP, but for the sake of what I committing to <laughs> what I said earlier, I will go with the increased defense. Let's see, I still need to find a way to get some amber. For now though, let's see, is there any smaller buildings I want to build? Um, yeah, let's build a wood mill. I should have done that a couple turns ago. Um, and you can only build one building at a time. There is a research to upgrade that so you can build your Q buildings. Um, excavation, let's buy those skeletons that I've got going here. Also, I just realized I haven't actually touched on the research trees. So let's look at that. So there are two, there are character trees and then there are uh, economy trees and stuff like that. So the character trees, these increase the stats of your army. So for example here, humans can have increased defense, health, uh, offense, and these are different for each faction, I believe. There are a little bit of crossovers, but there's a little bit of difference. For example, I don't believe humans have a the human faction itself has an option to increase the HP of its units quite as significantly as this, plus two to undead. And then we have the initiative for your undead troops, melee. And then over here, these are typically uh, defense. I've also, oh yeah, these were, so offense and defense essentially. But these are for specific units so these are for toxologists and banes and this is for rats and plague rats and these are for your oathbound and legionaries so these are upgrades for specific units and then over here in the economy you can unlock this to build things that increase your resource gain per turn in this case amber gold uh, and this was the simultaneous construction building that i was talking about that lets you create multiple buildings at once this gives your wielders extra starting arcana at the start of combat. Well, let's see you cast your spells a little bit earlier. And then over here, these increase your troop size. So up here, you can see that I can only have 100 risen or 40 oathbound or 20 cultists in one stack. This increases how many of those you can have per stack. It's pretty good for building a larger army. How do you get these in the large slots? I might have glossed over earlier. The only things I was able to build at the time, well, here I can go in here and actually look, are the research centers. There's two, one for each of those two different tabs you saw in the previous menu. And that, once you have built this, you can start committing to those researches. There's also a summoning circle here, which summons a unit. Pretty neat. Uh, and yeah, that is essentially the core mechanics of the game. Songs of Conquest is available for $29.99 currently on the Steam store. Should you buy it for that price? Personally, in early access, I think that it has plenty of content for a $30 price tag. There's two campaigns. After four hours, I'm still not finished with all of the missions in the first one. There's custom games, skirmishes. There's multiplayer if you want to play with your friends. Four different factions to play with. I think that there, there's plenty of content that you can experiment with so far. And I think that it's only going to get better. It's a good investment. There will be more content to play through later. $30? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and buy it. I'm rambling now. Just go ahead. Go ahead. I think that it's worth it if you like this kind of game. With that said, thank you for watching. I have been the Loose Critic. If you enjoyed this video, you can show your support by hitting the like or subscribe buttons below. And if you didn't, you can hit that dislike button. Trust me, my feeling will be hurt. I'll see you next time. No time for chase, just swords and spades.